Hey, good morning, everybody. And thank you so much for joining us for um, our Hernando County Extension Vegetable Gardening class. Today, we're gonna to be talking about how to control winter vegetable garden pests. So as we go along, I'm gonna be uh, a little distracted here, letting more people into the Zoom room. And if you see this picture here on the first slide, I got pounded on Facebook for this, for using this picture because of what this caterpillar turns into. So we're gonna to touch on that again at the very, very end. So remember this caterpillar, we're gonna kind of come back to it before the very end, because this makes a really important point about is a pest really a pest? And do you need to control every pest? And what do you need to think about before you do that? So let's go ahead and kind of um, get into the topic here. What some of the things that we're gonna cover is what exactly is a pest? So when we're talking about a pest, what does that include? Everybody assumes that it must be insects, but not always. There's plenty of other things in your vegetable garden that can be a pest that are not necessarily an insect. And we're gonna look at how to look at dealing with pests in the edible garden, because this is a little bit different than necessarily your, um, your lawn or your ornamental plantings, because you don't eat your lawn, you don't eat your hibiscus or your rose bush, but things that you grow in your vegetable garden, you are gonna be eating, so you need to be aware and comfortable with what you're using to control pests out there. And we're gonna look at specifically some common pests that you're gonna encounter on your fall and winter vegetable crops. Last week, we talked about what kind of things you should be growing right now during the fall and winter up until the very beginning of spring here in Florida. And most of the timing that I talk about is more specifically for central Florida, if you're watching us from North Florida or South Florida, the information is generally the same, but the timing might be a little bit different because Florida is a very, very long state and the weather up in Jacksonville is different from here in Hernando County and very different from down in Miami. So timing might be a little bit different, but the information is the same. And then we're gonna go through some of the recommended controls to help control some of the pests that you're probably going to encounter this fall and winter. So what is a pest? What is the definition of a pest? Basically, it's anything that competes with, injures, or spreads diseases to humans, which we're not talking about. That would be more mosquitoes and, and uh, bed bugs and things like that. Domestic animals, that would be fleas, flies, all the different um, pests that our animals have to deal with. Desirable plants, vegetable garden is desirable plants, structures which would be termites and then possessions which would be more um, post-harvest things and roaches and problems inside of our house. So pest control, if you're looking at controlling things or if you have a pest control service that um, comes and sprays and takes care of your house, you're looking at using some kind of insecticide that prevents them from entering the house or the space that you wanna keep them out of and it kills basically all the pests that have already established a presence within the space, whether it's your garden, your house, whatever it might be. Really outdoors, we're not looking at specifically pest control because you know you can't sanitize the great outdoors. You can, if your plant is having a problem with some kind of insect, you can't necessarily kill 100.00% of all of them. It's not gonna work, it's gonna be very expensive, you're gonna be using a huge amount of chemicals out in the environment, which is bad for a number of different reasons. It's bad for you, it's bad for others in the environment, and it's bad for the environment, basically. So what we're gonna do is how we're gonna look at things is following uh, Integrated Pest Management or IPM plan. And these are some of the tactics of IPM. Starting at the bottom, you start at the bottom of the pyramid. The largest section here is where you're gonna put most of your time and effort and planning into. So taking steps for cultural controls, you're gonna to look to grow crops that have natural disease resistance. You're gonna follow good sanitation techniques, proper irrigation, proper planting dates. We're gonna talk a little bit more about all them. As we move up, you're gonna use physical and mechanical methods to help avoid pests and deal with pests. Things like pruning, hand picking, I know our Florida Friendly Landscape Coordinator, Lily Browning, 
likes to tell about if she has a plant in her yard like a hibiscus and it has aphids or mealybugs on one of the growing tips, she pulls out her clippers, snips off that tip and gets rid of it. Problem solved. You don't always have to spray the entire plant or your entire yard to get rid of a small insect pest outbreak and deal with it and now it's not a problem anymore. But physical and mechanical includes using proper mulch also to help block weeds and keep weeds from coming up, uh, solarization and trap crops during the summer months. Uh, we're gonna encourage biological controls. Those are all the other insects and things like predators, parasites, parasitoids. We're gonna make our yards bird friendly. Birds can provide a large amount of insect pest control. Just the other day, I was out there picking my last two calabasa squash in my garden. And a little bird flew up, flew down, landed on a leaf, grabbed a little green caterpillar, flew up into the tree and gobbled them up. So I'm thinking, that's great. The bird took care of a caterpillar for me that I didn't have to take care of, I didn't have to spray for. So birds, lizards, a lot of different organisms out there in your yard are gonna give you a lot of free and effective pest control. So when worse comes to worse, we may get to the point where we're going to have to use some kind of chemical control to control whatever our problem is, whether it's an insect pest, whether it's weeds, whether it's a fungus or a bacteria. And you always want to start with the least toxic, safest to use product that's still going to be effective for what you're trying to control. There's no point spraying product A if your problem is insect B and product A does not work on insect B. And that's what we're to help. We're here to help advise you on those things, give you resources to be able to check. And if nothing else, just shoot me an email and you say, you know, I have a problem with caterpillars on my um, cabbage plants and we could tell you exactly what to do. And then when worse comes to worse, the very, very last tactic that you're gonna use is more conventional, broad spectrum insecticides, things that you may have in your shed, things like seven, malathion, maybe you still have old pesticides that have been off the market for many years. Sometimes it's kind of scary to think about what people have in the very, very back corner of their garden shed, or maybe what you inherited from the previous owner or your grandparents or something. Some of those things are not the kind of controls that you wanna be using or exposing yourself to or using on any kind of edible crop. So when we're talking about common pests out in the garden, you know, yeah, that could include your pets. You might have to put up a fence to keep the dogs out. It may include the neighborhood kids, your kids, your neighbors. Potentially there's a lot of pests out there, squirrels and animals if you live out in the country, deer, and we're not really gonna touch so much on them. What we're gonna start with is talking about different insects that you might encounter. And this is specifically on the fall and winter garden if you're growing fall and winter crops. So we have some good news and some bad news. The good news is a lot of the really bad insect pests that could be a huge problem, especially during the heat of summer, are really either not present at all during the fall and winter once we really cool off and get into the cool season, or they're much less active and there's far fewer of them out there. Things like spider mites. Spider mites love it when it's very, very hot and dry and sunny. So you may have a problem with them on a lot of ornamental plants. That could be a huge problem on azaleas and hibiscus and hedge bushes and a lot of vegetables when it's very hot and sunny. They're gone during the winter. They don't like the cool weather. They tend to go dormant and hibernate for the winter. So you generally see either no or very, very few spider mites during winter. Aphids, you don't see a lot of. Aphids tend to go into hibernation or for insects is called diapause. So um, vocabulary word for today, diapause is insect hibernation. Aphids go into uh, diapause over the winter. Stink bugs, like in the picture here, uh, green stink bugs, you see very few of during the winter. Root knot nematodes, if you have a problem with them in your garden soil, they are very active when it's hot, sunny, and the soil is good and warm. And if your soil is very, very sandy, it makes them very happy. 
they're still present during the winter, but they're not nearly as active and they're not gonna cause nearly as much damage. So we kind of, if you have a huge problem with root knot nematodes, they may still damage your crops noticeably during the winter. But if you only have a small number or a small problem with nematodes, you may actually have very, very few problems with them during the winter. So that's nice. And then pickle worms, they are the uh, little caterpillars that will get into your cucumbers and squash, which really are not normally a wintertime crop here in central Florida. South of us down in South Florida, you can grow cucumbers and summer squash during the winter. Pickle worms tend to die back. And especially after we get a freeze or frost, they will all die and disappear here in central Florida. And they get frozen back all the way back to South Florida. So in the spring, when things start to warm up, they move from South Florida and they move north. Bit by bit by bit, by April or May, they're here in Central Florida. They keep going north. They go as far as the Carolinas by the end of summer. Then when we get into fall and winter, you get the frost, first frost, boom, they're all knocked back all the way to South Florida. So they go in a cycle, but they're not here in Central Florida during the winter. There are still some things that you will see and you will have problems with, mostly caterpillars. They're probably the most common insect pest on vegetable crops here during the winter. And certain beetles can be a problem also. So what you can expect to see is gonna be caterpillars, lots of different caterpillars, flea beetles, and different fungal diseases, mostly causing fungal leaf spots on some crops. So the picture of that nice, pretty green caterpillar there is a beet army worm, and it is gonna eventually turn into the little moth here. They're very small. The moth is, I don't know, maybe a half an inch wide. Many of these caterpillars, when they mature, just turn into a small, nondescript, brown, gray, white kind of moth. They're very difficult for us to identify and tell the difference between them. But the caterpillars all do the same, beet army worms, will eat a wide variety of crops, different leafy green crops, uh, cabbage loopers or another one. And you're gonna see a number of other caterpillars out there basically munching on the leaves of your vegetable crops. You will also see some fungal diseases and bacterial diseases. Bacterial diseases are a lot less common than fungi. And the picture right in the middle of these three is a broccoli leaf. And if you try growing broccoli or cabbage or cauliflower, they're all in the same family. They're all closely related. You may get fungal problems on your broccoli, fungal leaf spots, and the leaves are gonna start to look like this one here with brown and black and yellow. They're gonna fall off and it's gonna cause damage. But with fungal diseases, you have to keep in mind, what do fungi really, really like? What makes them happy? What is gonna make them spread and infect your plants and attack your plants and start to cause a lot of damage? You need basically three things to make fungi happy, healthy, and spread like crazy. That's gonna be, you need a host. So you have to have a plant that can actually be a host to that fungus. Your broccoli can catch different various fungal diseases, but your broccoli will never catch a disease that affects oak trees because oak trees are completely different from broccoli plants. So not every plant can catch every fungal disease out there, but every plant is generally susceptible to at least a couple fungal diseases. You have to have the pathogen or the disease present. And all these different diseases are present here in Florida. They uh, stay in the soil. They make resting spores. They can last for a very, very long time in the soil and survive until an appropriate host comes along and then they go ahead and attack it and cause the disease. Um, a lot of fungal spores just blow in the wind. So there's not a whole lot you could do to sanitize and protect your garden to keep everything out. Because once again, you can't sanitize the great outdoors. But a very important thing, component of whether you're gonna have diseases or not is the environment. And fungal diseases really like an environment that's warm warm to hot during the day and warm at night, very humid, fungi like regular rain and wet leaves. It helps keep them moist. Kind of the weather that we have most of the year here from spring all the way through fall. So that's why we have 
huge problems with fungal diseases all summer long because once we get into summer weather pattern, it's hot during the day, it's warm at night, it never gets really cool. It's always 90 to 100% humidity. We get frequent rains, it rains late in the day and at night. Your plants sit out there soaking wet all night long. Fungi love that. During the winter, we don't have that kind of weather a lot of times. Weather gets cooler, gets cooler at night, humidity drops, think, beautiful weather during the winter, the reason why so many people love to move to Florida, because it's just so pleasant here. Low humidity, sunny, but not necessarily hot, cooler at night. So if you take steps to additional steps to help avoid fungal problems, you're going to have far, far fewer problems during the winter. So you should use some, def some um, basic cultural controls, things like proper irrigation for your garden, it's best to use drip irrigation because you really want to try to keep those plant leaves dry as much as you can. If you use overhead irrigation, that's fine. That's not going to be a huge problem, but you want to irrigate and water your garden very early in the morning. That way you, you wet the soil, the plants are, are moist and growing, the sun comes up and dries off the leaves and all the rest of the day and night your leaves are dry. That's great. That's a great way to avoid fungal diseases. Fertilization, that's just basically growing healthy plants. Healthy plants are better able to uh, protect themselves from fungal diseases. Sanitation, if you think back a slide or two to that infected broccoli leaf, when that leaf gets really bad and yellow and brown and big black splotches on it, it's going to fall off the plant you need to pick up those kind of diseased leaves and dead plants, pick them up and pull them out of your garden and throw them in the trash. Because if you leave them, they're covered with fungal spores now. And the first time it rains, it's gonna splash them over your healthy plants and your disease problem is gonna spread and spread and get worse and worse and worse. So follow good sanitation practices in your garden. Genetic resistance, that's just um, trying to use varieties of vegetables that are resistant to a lot of different diseases, every little bit helps. Proper planting time and plant selection. We talked about that last week. You need to be planting vegetables that are appropriate for the time of year. If you try to plant things too far out of season, you're gonna have a lot more disease problems. You're gonna have a lot more insect problems also as we're gonna to get to in a little bit here. So go out there and scout frequently look over your garden, check your plants. When you start to have a little bit of a disease problem, you know, be aware of it, take note of it, learn the different signs and symptoms of some of the common diseases and learn when to treat with fungicides. We're gonna talk about what, what you can use as a fungicide in a little bit here. So going back to cultural controls, these are all basic steps that are gonna help you avoid a lot of problems. So that that old saying that um, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, think that when you're thinking cultural controls. So once again, that's proper irrigation, proper fertilization, you're gonna be growing healthy vegetable plants, putting the right plant in the right place at the right time of year is extremely important for being successful growing vegetables. Try to look for cultivars or varieties that have a lot of um, resistant to our most common uh, diseases that we have here, sanitation, keep those weeds under control. A lot of, a lot of times weeds will be a um, holding place or a sink for different diseases and insect pests. So weeds along with competing with your plants for water and fertilizer are little hiding spots for diseases and insects. So you wanna to try to keep everything weed free, use a mulch, in your vegetable garden, you're not gonna be using things like wood chips that you would in your hedges and ornamental garden. You can use um, grass clippings, pine needles, uh, shredded up leaves that fall off of your trees. I know during the fall, if you have things like maples uh, or other deciduous trees, when all the leaves fall, don't rake them up and put them in bags and you know set them by the curb that's a valuable resource to either grind up and make compost with, which we're gonna be covering compost in just a few weeks in an upcoming class, or grind the leaves up and use them as mulch in your vegetable garden. It's gonna work great. Leaves are gonna break down, 
They're going to help to block the weeds from coming up. When the leaves break down, it's going to help build up your soil. So definite win-win situation. And in physical controls, you know, if you only have two caterpillars on your plants, you don't need to spend a lot of time going to the shed, pulling out something to spray, mixing it up, getting a pump sprayer, getting out your gloves. That's too much work. If you have two caterpillars, pick them off and just throw them over the fence. That's what I do. I have no idea if my neighbors know about that or if it bothers them. But if you throw a caterpillar over the fence, he's not coming back to your broccoli plant. Problem solved. Mulch, mulch is gonna help prevent a lot of problems. Like I said, weeds popping up and harboring insect pests and diseases. Soil solarization is a totally different topic. That's something you do during the heat of summer. And I'm sure that we'll have a class about that coming up. If you're interested in using soil solarization, University of Florida has a lot of really good resources online. So just go ahead and Google University of Florida soil solarization, and you'll find a lot of good information and directions on how to do that. So what kind of different fungal diseases can you expect to see during fall and winter? Mostly uh, a couple little random diseases that, you know, like the one I showed you on the broccoli leaf. You have a lot of problems with powdery mildew also. Powdery mildew is like a whitish fungus. It almost looks like somebody sprinkled talcum powder on, your le on the leaves of your plants. It could be on the top a lot of times, or it might be on the bottom. And powdery mildew is kind of funny because I said earlier, most fungi like it when it's pretty hot during the day and warm at night. Powdery mildew likes it a little bit cooler, actually enjoys the cooler weather and can do fine on your plants during fall and winter. So the one you mostly are going to see and you want to watch out for is powdery mildew. But there are, uh, depending on the exact plant and crop you're growing, there's a couple other fungi that you might have to deal with. So going back to insecticides and insects. If you have a problem with insects in your fall and winter garden, what do you basically want to have in your control toolkit? Well, first of all, before you go spying or spraying anything, you want to be careful of what you use to help protect the beneficial insect populations. Because things like ladybugs are still out during the winter, and ladybugs are going to eat a lot of pest insects. There's a lot of other beneficial insects out there that help to naturally keep the pest populations under control. So you need to be proactive, go out there and scout frequently. And what that means is go out there and check your garden. Go through your garden, turn over leaves, try to figure out who is living there. Do I have a disease? Do I see the beginnings of powdery mildew? Maybe the very beginnings, I need to take some kind of action to help it from getting out of control and being a big problem. Do I see a caterpillar or two? Or do I see 20 little teeny tiny caterpillars that just hatched on my cabbage plants. What do I do? What do I spray? Do I pick off 20 of them and throw them over the fence like that guy on Zoom told me to, or what do I do? So you need to scout frequently just to be aware of everything that's going on in your garden. It's really going to help to catch these problems early instead of waiting for them to get out of control and then trying to get things back into control after you've suffered a lot of damage. ID pests accurately. So Thinking back to the very, very opening slide, I had that great big pretty caterpillar. For that, you need to be aware of exactly what it is before you go grabbing some kind of spray and spraying, you know, randomly all around your yard. So you need to be able to ID what you're dealing with before you contact us, because if you say, I have bugs, I'm going to say, what kind of bugs do you have? If you go, I don't know, then I have to tell you, well, I don't know what to do because if I don't know what kind of bugs you have, I don't know what to do and you don't know what to do either. So uh, identification is very important, but going specifically into what kind of problems you may have and what you should do about it, start with a product that's called Bacillus thuringiensis. And that's a big word. The short name for it or what we commonly call it is BT. That is a naturally occurring bacteria this out naturally in the environment, and it helps to control caterpillars naturally in the environment. 
when caterpillars eat a leaf that has Bt uh, fungal spores on it or bacterial spores, sorry, on it, they ingest the bacteria. It basically germinates within their stomachs and within a day or less, the caterpillar stops feeding and within a couple a day or two, the caterpillar will pass away. The caterpillar will die. This is something that's out there naturally in the environment. When you end up with a huge number of caterpillars, for anybody who might be deliberately raising caterpillars, um, milkweed, um, they're trying to grow monarch butterfly caterpillars. If you get too many caterpillars in one place, outbreaks of diseases that are caused by bacteria and viruses will naturally break out. You can't have too many caterpillars all stuffed together on the same plant feeding on that plant and pooping and defecating and everything else all over the place, one is gonna get a disease and it's gonna spread and you're gonna lose all your caterpillars. If caterpillars are on a problem on your cabbage plants, you want to lose all the caterpillars. So a fantastic control for them. And you can purchase this either online or at the big box stores. It goes under uh, different trade names. So the product name is gonna be Organic Caterpillar Killer, Organic Caterpillar Control, Dipel is a big uh, brand, but you're going to be looking for the active ingredient, Bt or Bacillus thuringiensis. Bt works great on caterpillars, doesn't hurt anything else. Won't hurt the bird that eats the caterpillar that eats the Bt, doesn't hurt the lizard that eats the caterpillar that eats the Bt or anything else. But keep in mind, BT is not going to control beetles or any other problem. It just controls caterpillars. Another good caterpillar control is a product that the active ingredient is either spinosin or spinosad, S-P-I-N-O-S-A-D. And this is available now to homeowners. Growers have been using it for a number of years. Spinosad is another naturally occurring bacteria that they have discovered and they're able to put it to make it shelf stable, put it in a bottle, you mix it with the recommended amount of water and spray it on your plants. It works very well on caterpillars, works very well on thrips, works very well on leaf miners. Leaf miners are tiny little almost microscopic caterpillars that will feed in the center of a leaf and it looks like somebody drew scribbles on your plant's leaves. The only thing that works well on them is spinosad. Everything else, if you spray it, it's on the outside of the leaf. The little caterpillars on the inside, so it's not going to get to them. But spinosad does get to them. So spinosad, another great control. For most all small, soft-bodied insects, and this goes for fall and winter, this goes for spring and summer, this goes for everything from spider mice to aphids to mealybugs to scales to a lot of different things. Insecticidal soap works really well. This is proper insecticidal soap, not dish detergent. So dish detergent is great for cleaning pots and pans. Insecticidal soap is great for controlling small soft body insects on your plants. It's made from potassium fatty acids, which is not what is in your dishwashing liquid. That's not what you clean your pots and pans with. So they're different. Insecticidal soap is labeled as an insecticide. It has directions. It has mixing directions to use it as an insecticide. Has all the uh, first aid information you may need if it splashes in your eyes or splashes in your mouth or you breathe it in or something. So insecticidal soap, use that on your plants. Dish soap, use that in the kitchen, in the sink. You don't want to use that on your plants. We're going to touch on that again near the very end. Another group of very, very effective insecticides that are very safe for you to use, we've been using them for many, many years, are different types of crop oils. So dormant oils is what your grandparents used. And this is an oil, but you don't ever want to spray it on a plant that has leaves on it because what it does is it has a phytotoxic effects on, uh, on the leaves and will scorch them and make them, after a couple of days, they look really, really dried up and brown, they'll all fall off. Dormant oil works very, very well on fruit trees where their leaves fall off during the winter. 
So if you have um, a peach, a plum, a nectarine tree, if you have an apple tree, they don't do really well in Florida, but you may have an apple tree, they lose their leaves in the fall. Any of those um, persimmons drop their leaves over the winter. When your tree has no leaves, you can spray it with a dormant oil. And what this does is it kills any little insects that are hiding in the bark or on the trunk, spending the winter there that are just gonna pop back out in the spring and be a problem. So it's a really good preventative control to kill anything that's hiding on the tree over the winter. There are um, different crop oils now that you can use on plants that have leaves, but you can't use those during the heat of summer because they're probably going to be phytotoxic. It's going to basically sunburn your plants. All the leaves are going to fall off. You don't want to do that. But during fall and winter, the days are shorter. It's not as hot. It's not as sunny. The sun is much lower in the sky. It's not right overhead. So during the winter, you can safely use um, different crop oils on your plants. And it's totally safe to use neem oil. I know a lot of people like to use neem for a wide variety of different problems and pests. But keep in mind, if you're using neem oil, it's still an oil. And oils can sunburn and fry your plants during the heat of summer. But neem oil is much safer to use during the winter. Neem oil is kind of a mixed bag. It depends on the brand, depends on the formulation. It literally depends on the batch that the company mixed up. There's a lot of variation in neem oil. It can be effective to um, suppress insects from feeding. So insects may be on your plant, but you cover it with neem oil and they're like, yuck, I'm not gonna feed on the plant now. Uh, it can be a deterrent against insects. It can kill certain insects. It can help um, uh, as a fungicide. It can help control certain fungal diseases. It can help with powdery mildew, believe it or not. So it's not necessarily the most effective or guaranteed control, but you know, it's worth a try. And a lot of people like using it. So neem oil, you after you use it, you need to go back and make sure that it did what you were hoping it would do, and then either use it again or try using something else. <laughs> a very, very good uh, pest control uh, that's very effective and very safe to use is a product that contains pyrethrin. Now this is different from pyrethroids. So if that word has O-I-D-S on the end, that's something that they probably use as a pest control inside your house. Commercial growers use it. There's a lot of different pyrethroids that are used. Pyrethrin is very safe to use. It's made from chrysanthemum plants from Africa. It's a very good contact insecticide. Breaks down quickly in the environment. So after it's only effective for about a day outside. After that, it breaks down into harmless components. So it's not going to stay in the soil for a long time. It's not going to be a danger to you if you apply it correctly. It's not a big danger to your pets, your kids, the neighbors. Pyrethrin works great on larger insects beetles, um, stink bugs, uh, things like that, that might that aren't necessarily a problem during the winter, but in the spring and fall, if you have a problem with stink bugs, use pyrethrin because you spray it on there. If you hit a stink bug, boom, they will fall off your plant dead. Very, very effective, very safe to use. And uh, manufacturers now are making some combination products. So you can go online and purchase a, a combination of pyrethrin and insecticidal soap that's mixed together in a concentrate. You follow the directions, add however many tablespoons to however many gallons of water, mix it up in a spray, and you get basically the double whammy to help control even more things. And both, if you follow the directions and mix it safely and spray it safely, are very safe for you to use. They're both um, approved for organic production for commercial organic growers. Diatomaceous earth is something else that you could try using. Uh, you need to be able, you need to purchase the diatomaceous earth that's labeled for garden use. There's another type that's used in some swimming pool filters. You don't want to use that. That can be very dangerous if you breathe it in. So get the correct diatomaceous earth. It's a powder. It looks like talcum powder. And you 
spread it out amongst your plants in the ground. This could help with things like slugs, snails. They can be a problem sometimes in winter if you have too many millipedes. Sow bugs are also called potato bugs, roly polies. If you have too many of them, occasionally they'll start chewing on your little sprouts, your little baby plants that are just coming up. Diatomaceous earth can help with that. The problem is the first time you water your garden or it rains, it totally washes away. So you're going to have to reapply it. So some organic fungicides. Like I mentioned, if you have fungal problems, your, your best line of defense against them is different preventative measures. But if you do have an outbreak of a fungal problem, most all fungicides are only good as a protectant. If you wait until your broccoli plant is just covered with the fungus and every single leaf is brown and black and yellow and about to drop off, it's too late to use a fungicide. It's not gonna help at that point. If you notice the first beginnings, the first couple little spots on your broccoli plant and you use a fungicide, then it will protect all the new leaves and all the unaffected leaves and hopefully keep them safe from the fungus spreading to those leaves and having the fungus spread and get worse. Some things that you can use, um, things like uh, liquid copper or copper fungicides, we've been using them for, gosh, hundred, literally hundreds of years. If you follow the directions, they're safe to use. Copper can be a dangerous um, uh, natural earth element. You know, they mine it from the ground. Um, that's used to, to help protect against a wide variety of fungal and bacterial diseases. There's another product that you can find called potassium bicarbonate. This is, this is a byproduct from, I believe, uh, concrete production. And that can be effective to help prevent diseases. You can purchase it. Uh, it's it's a, a granule kind of um, sandy powder that you mix with water and spray. So that's safe to use as a fungicide. There are some other things. If you have really bad problems when you plant your seeds, your plants grow a little bit and then they die. They get something um, called damping off. The plants get an inch or two tall and the stem right at ground level turns brown and black and a plant falls over dead. You may have soil borne diseases, really large numbers of soil borne diseases. Things like uh, different root rots, um, that will kill your plants. There are products you can get that you add to the soil when you're planting the seeds. There's full directions on the package that can help protect your seeds and your germinating seedlings from those diseases. There's products called Bacillus subtilis. You're going to have to Google these and look them up online or different types of trichoderma. Trichoderma is a fungus that naturally lives in the soil. And it's a very good fungus for plants because it, it colonizes and lives on your plant's roots and covers them and keeps the bad root rot funguses off. Because trichoderma is like a little space hog. So it takes up all the space on the root. And now the root rot fungus comes along and can't get a spot on the root because the trichoderma has just taken up all the space. I've used it before and it can be very, very effective in certain circumstances if you have a lot of problems with your plants dying from a root rot pathogen. So if you're trying to figure out, is that what my problem is? Contact us and we can give you more advice and help on that. Sulfur, sulfur is a very, very old fungicide. We've been using it since the, the time of the Romans. It's also an effective insecticide. It still works. Not many people really use it anymore. Uh, works very well against spider mites during the spring and summer, but can work as a fungicide also. So that's another possibility. There are also, I wanted to mention very, very quickly, insect parasitic, parasitic nematodes. So nematodes are microscopic roundworms that live in the soil. And some of them attack your plants. Root knot nematodes are going to attack your plants and damage them and kill them. Other nematodes eat other nematodes. Other nematodes eat bacteria and fungi in the soil. So they can help if they're eating fungi that are going to cause diseases on your plants. 
other nematodes attack very specific insects. So I was helping to give a class yesterday and we had a, a question about a lady was growing uh, either houseplants or something hydroponically and she had a problem with shore flies and fungus gnats. So if you're trying to grow things in damp soil, you can get little teeny tiny flies that are really, really annoying. And if you have too many of them, they will eventually start eating your plant roots and causing damage. And these are shore flies, fungus gnats, maybe fruit flies. They live in very, very moist soil. So there are products out there. You can buy a package of nematodes, either Steiner Nema or Heteroheptitis. Those are two uh, genera of nematodes that prey on other insects. So your problem may be curable by a beneficial nematode. And some of these nematodes you can actually purchase online. They are completely safe for you to use. And it's a way to control a problem that's not gonna kill everything else in your yard. So if the um, uh, lady who's asking about what she could do to help control fungus gnats and shore flies, if she purchases those nematodes and mixes it up in water, pours it around her plants, the only thing those nematodes will kill is the fungus gnat uh, larva that eventually turns into fungus gnats adults that fly around, not gonna hurt anything else. So there are a lot of really exciting new controls you can use out there on the market, something much better than the old fashioned just broad spectrum spray. I'm gonna spray and kill everything in my yard and hope for the best. So what about home remedies? Oh my gosh, I see these things on Facebook all the time and we get questions about them. Dish soap, we already talked about. Baking soda, baking soda doesn't really help. Baking soda is a uh, very, very high pH. So if you mix it with water and spray it on your plant's leaves, now the surface of the leaves is gonna be very high pH and fungi don't like that. So baking soda generally never hurts your plants, but it's probably not gonna be very effective or do a whole lot. Um, milk, people like to spray milk on their plants to control fungi or help protect them also. I believe that does the same thing. Milk has a very high pH, it's very alkaline, but other than kind of getting sticky, messy, and maybe stinky after a few days, Milk is just not very effective. There's more effective things that you can do. Urine, we're, we're not even gonna go there. You really don't wanna use that in the garden. Mothballs, please don't use mothballs for anything other than to protect your wool suits from clothes moths, if they're even still a problem nowadays. Um, maybe they are, maybe they're not. I don't have any wool suits, but um, don't ever use mothballs outside. They are extremely dangerous. We hear horror stories from people who put them underneath their trailer or manufacturer home or threw them up in the attic. And now they're wondering why their house smells funny and how do they get rid of the smell? If you do that, basically what you're doing is uh, creating a gas chamber and the active ingredient, the naphthalene that's in mothballs is very, very dangerous if you breathe it in. So no mothballs, guys unless you're using them to keep clothes moths out of your out of your clothes. These things, they're not generally not very effective. They can potentially damage your plants. A lot of dish soaps, especially if you use it at the wrong time of year, can burn through the cuticle, the natural waxy coating on your plant's leaves and do more damage than help. And in the case of mothballs, if you use them outdoors, if you read the label, it does not tell you to use it outdoors. You're not supposed to. So if you do that, technically you're breaking the law and you will be liable for any person or animal or anything that maybe get injured because you did that. So the final bit of good news when it comes to controlling pests on your uh, fall and winter vegetable garden is a lot of cool season crops really don't have any pests. I've grown carrots, radishes, leafy greens, onions, and I can't think of any major insect or uh, fungal diseases that I ever had to worry about. True, there are insects out there that can feed on carrots. Nematodes can be a problem. They're gonna deform the carrot a little bit, but they're still safe to eat. 
Like I said, nematodes are less active during the winter. So if your garden has a huge problem with nematodes, your carrots may get a little bit more deformed. But other than that, I've never seen a pest on carrots. Radishes, you'll get flea beetles. Flea beetles are a very tiny little beetle that will eat little tiny little round holes in your radish leaves. But you generally aren't eating radish leaves. You're eating the root that grows underground. So I've never had a problem with them. Leafy greens, you can get caterpillars. We already talked about what to use to control caterpillars. If you're growing lettuce and kale and things like that, and that you keep them too wet, or if we have a really wet winter and that happens sometimes, it can get a little bit, it can get a bacterial rot. But generally, leafy greens are not that much of a problem. Onions, I have never seen an insect pest or disease on onions. It can happen. It's just, I've never had a problem with it and it's gonna be very uncommon. A lot of times you may be able to get all the way through fall and winter without any problems on these crops. But if you push your luck and every spring, and we're gonna talk about this in our final class, wrapping up the fall and winter vegetable garden in a few weeks. So be sure to sign up for that and tune in. If you think that, well, I'm going to grow cabbage and kale and lettuce and everything, and I'm going to grow it in the summer because I'm going to use shade cloth, or I planted my vegetable garden in a slightly shady spot or whatever, or I can grow kale year round. It's not, the plant's not dead yet. What's going to happen is after we get through March, once we get up to maybe March 15th, April 1st, it's going to be spring and the weather's going to get warm. And it's going to get hot during the day. And the humidity is going to go up. And if you're trying to grow broccoli, cabbage, kale, it's mostly those crops. You will have huge outbreaks of fungal diseases in April, along with harlequin bugs, which are very, very pretty bugs, like pictured on the left here, or Colorado potato beetles, because they come out in the spring. And if you're trying to push those winter crops into spring or you think you're going to push them in the summer, these guys are there to tell you spring is here, get rid of the kale, get rid of the lettuce. Your cabbage should have been done by March 1st or March 15th. Time to move on to those springtime vegetables. So if you try to push things to beyond winter, you're going to have a lot more problems. So here is my email. And Let's talk a little bit more about this caterpillar. So if anybody who sat, you know, I was about to say savaged. I, I, I've seen worse on Facebook. I've seen much worse on Facebook. But for the people who mentioned that you probably don't want to kill this caterpillar, you know, why am I using this caterpillar in conjunction with controlling pests in your winter garden? Let's talk about this caterpillar. This is a big these guys get really big when they're fully mature, right before they uh, make a chrysalis and then come out as a butterfly. They're like finger long. They're big, fat caterpillars. And you will find them feeding on your, this is parsley here. They feed on parsley, dill, and fennel. For anybody who grows fennel, you can grow all three of those herbs here during the winter. They don't grow during the summer. They will not do well at all during the summer if you can even get them to germinate and grow. But you can plant them right now. I just planted dill in a container just a week or so ago. It's all coming up and I'm gonna grow a ton of dill this winter. The problem is this caterpillar here is eventually gonna to wanna to eat my dill. These caterpillars are generally not out or present during winter. They come back out during the spring once we start to get into spring, eventually they're going to come out. And you may get a few of them during the winter, but not a whole lot because the butterfly that lays the eggs that gives you the caterpillar is not that active during winter, during most of Florida. So this caterpillar turns into the eastern black swallowtail butterfly. And if you have a butterfly garden, this is the kind of butterfly that you are hoping and envisioning is gonna show up in your butterfly garden. Well, it comes from a caterpillar that wants to eat your parsley and your dill. And you're thinking, well, darn, I wanna eat dill and parsley. You can, plant your dill and parsley right now. Have it come up, take good care of it, 
keep it evenly watered. It does really well in containers. That's how I grow mine. Lightly fertilize it. Pretty soon, within a month or so, the plants are going to come up and you'll be able to pick parsley, pick dill. You can dry dill very, very easily. And just a few dill plants, because the plants get almost waist high. They get to be large plants. You'll get a lot of dill. Plan on you eating the dill all winter long. When we head into spring and you start to see these caterpillars on them, figure spring is here. I'm done with the dill. I already got my share. I'm going to be nice and give the rest of these caterpillars. And if you're able to raise a bunch of those big fat striped caterpillars on your dill and your parsley, because once it starts to get hot, your dill and parsley, the quality of it goes downhill really fast. Yeah, the plants are alive. Yeah, you can pick it. It doesn't, it's, you're not eating quality dill and parsley. It's better when the weather's cool. When it gets hot, doesn't taste that good. Tastes just fine to the caterpillars. So basically move or dedicate your leftover parsley and dill to your butterfly garden, give it to the caterpillars, and then hopefully you will be able to add a lot of these uh, black swallowtail butterflies to your butterfly collection in your yard. Because you know, if you have the correct host plants in your yard and you have the caterpillars in your yard and they grow up there, they can fly. A lot of times they'll fly away, but a lot of times they'll stay pretty close to where they were raised. So I've always found if you have host plants, you put up with caterpillars that eat all your passion vine and all your milkweed and eventually all your parsley and your dill, and you end up with a ton of butterflies coming out from them, you will have an amazing number of butterflies all summer long. So, so hopefully this is just a good example of why, why insect identification is important before you jump right to control. Because sometimes you're gonna be in kind of a gray area, like do I really wanna control them or not? So that, is the end of my PowerPoint. Let me go ahead and go back into the questions here. And Neil points out that we we're blessed not to be hit by Ian. Yes, I agree. I mean, we're, we were very, very fortunate. Hopefully none of us will ever have to deal with something like that here. Although there's always a possibility you always need to be prepared, and goodness knows we have plenty of classes on preparing your trees, your landscape, everything else for, for that kind of weather. Neil asks, does the ark have a large garden? Would it be possible to visit it? Um, sure, Neil, go ahead and shoot me an email, and I will put you in touch with somebody there at ARC. And they're, they're normally there Tuesdays, I believe, but they can tell you exactly where they are. And you can come out and visit the garden and see what they're doing there. Neil asks, when it comes to different types of soaps to control insects, what about Castile soap? Castile soap is a very, very old um, brand of soap that is actually still a soap. There's a difference between soap and detergent. And almost all the stuff that you use on your dishes now is some type of detergent. Castile soap is still a soap. You can use it on your plants. I think you're going to get a better result with insecticidal soap. So Castile soap is going to be safer for you to use on plants. Um, you, if you're going to use it, you probably want to spray a leaf or a couple leaves first and wait a day or so just to make sure you're not going to have a phytotoxic or negative effect on your plants before you go spraying your entire garden with it. After you spray your entire garden, you can't unspray it and do that. But yeah, Castile soap, if you can find it, people still use that. Uh, Bridget says, can I control hibernating pests now to prevent pests becoming a problem for next year? Yes and no. So yes, in the sense of if we're talking about any kind of tree that loses its leaves during the winter, which is a deciduous tree, if you use uh, dormant oil on the trunk once or twice during the winter, that helps reduce pests next year. So even your crepe myrtles, if you had problems, crepe myrtles lose all their leaves during the winter, you can spray your crepe myrtles 
with a dormant oil, and it helps to kill any of those pests that are just kind of hunkered down under the bark and around the cracks and everything on the bark until spring comes back. Then they're going to go out and damage your crepe myrtle or your peach or your plum once again. Um, the one thing, honestly, that puts the biggest dent in pest insects when we're talking about problems early next spring or not is the weather. If we have a lot of really strong freezes and frost, that will knock the insects back a lot. And they will always come back. White flies and aphids and all those different things never are gonna go extinct because of cold fronts, but they will get knocked back very hard so that they're slower to come back next spring. So if you get your spring garden in early, like we will tell you how to do in upcoming future classes, you hit that sweet spot between no longer freezing, weather is nice, plants are gonna grow well, we have freezes so the insects are slow coming back, you may have that perfect window there combined with not a whole lot of rain, low humidity, beautiful sunny weather to give you a bumper crop in the spring. It happens sometimes, but if the weather doesn't cooperate, it may not happen every year. So. There's really no, uh, and weed control, weed control helps a lot with uh, getting rid of those overwintering insect pests and their eggs and their larvae where they might be hiding, uh, keeping the weeds down. All those different things help, but none of them are going to like guarantee you that you won't have pests next year. You will have pests. It's just if you can kind of prevent them a little bit longer, that's going to really help. Will the PowerPoint be available? Sure, for anybody who wants the PowerPoint, let me go ahead and put my email in here. I put my email address in the chat comments. So if you want to shoot me an email, I'll go ahead and send you a PDF copy of the PowerPoint that I use. And for anybody watching this in the future as a recorded class, if you email me also, um, my email address is W-L-E-S-T-E-R at U-F-L dot E-D-U. If you send me an uh, email, more than happy to send you a copy of the PowerPoint slides. And Tricia says, I grow herbs in containers. That's great. So do I. That's the easiest way to grow herbs. There are lots of tiny white insects that fly up when I want them. Not sure if it is white fly or not. It could very easily be white fly. If you walk up, an, an easy way to tell if it's white fly, if you walk up to a plant and you just tap it lightly, and little white, tiny flying insects come flying out of it, it's probably white fly. If you're working around your plants and you see little gnats or things that are flying off the surface of the soil, it might be a soil borne uh, insect pest like. Fungus gnats, shore flies, that just means you're keeping the soil too wet. Uh, but white flies, sure, the herbs are still safe to eat. It's just white flies are going to feed on the plants and damage them. Insecticidal soap will work very well for them. You will have to spray on a regular basis. Follow the label directions and spray every couple of weeks or as often as it recommends. And you can get white flies under control and the good news is, is in a month or two or three or a month or two at this point, white flies will be gone for a while during the winter. White flies are generally not a big wintertime pest. They start off in the spring, their populations go skyrocket and go up and up and up and up and up. And they are at their maximum number in August. Then after that, they drop off. So white flies are gonna go away soon, hopefully. Bobby, who is one of our Master Gardener volunteers, put in the chat box here. ARC is on Mondays. They're there working on Mondays from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. The ARC Nature Coast Center is on Neff Lake Road, not the one on Mariner. So they have two different centers. The one where we have a garden at is the one on Neff Lake Road. If you Google ARC of the Nature Coast, they do have a website. You can find their address on there. You can GPS it so you don't get lost. And our master gardeners are there if you want to visit with them and see what they're doing from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. on Mondays. And I have my um, email in there. 
Angela, thank you so much for tuning in and watching. Um, this wouldn't be gratifying if nobody tuned in. Lily and I have done these presentations just to get the recording out of it to only a few people, but it's great when we have a lot of people joining in, a lot of engagement, people asking questions. Like I said, this is being recorded and I'll shut that off in just a moment. I will send out a link to the recording to everybody who registered for this before the end of the day. It takes a little bit for Zoom to finish it and me to finish it and get it out there. But we'll get that out there to you.